Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us. We know post-COVID online events are really the only way for us to share information with each other. And the time in front of our laptops, unfortunately, has increased. So we hope you can focus, shut off your chat apps and email for a few minutes, and enjoy learning a bit about going global and building a subscription strategy that scales. We should have some time for a short Q&A at the end, so feel free to send us questions. And if we can't get to them, we will be sharing out our email addresses at the end of the webinar. As a quick introduction, I'm Jenna Weyer, the VP of Partnerships and Head of Payments at Recurly. I've been in payments for over a decade and started my career as employee number three at Braintree, which is now owned by PayPal. I'm also joined by a fellow payments geek and product specialist from Adyen, Sophia Goldberg. Thank you for joining me, Sophia. Did you want to give a quick intro on yourself and tell us a bit about your experience? Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Um, thanks for the intro and, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to learn more about topics that we're both pretty, uh, pretty enthusiastic about. Um, so I'm Sophia Goldberg. I'm on the product team at Adyen out of our San Francisco office. Um, and I manage our suite of e-commerce optimization products from the U.S. Uh, I've been with Addy in about three and a half years, um, initially on the account management team, helping some of our global merchants scale. Um, and then in the past year, I've transitioned over to our product team to help uh, merchants scale from a, a different perspective. Awesome. Thank you. I'd like to quickly go over our agenda and topics we will cover today. Um, first is why subscriptions. Recurly has been around for about a decade and we've seen the evolution not only in the subscription space, but also payments over this period of time. Um, as listeners and as also as consumers, we've all seen the various types of subscription offerings now available, right? From Netflix, even to a Burger King or Panera coffee subscription. Um, second topic we'll be covering is the nuances of recurring payments. Subscription payments and the technology you need to power this model is very different than a one-time sale or purchase. There are some blind spots, and like I said, nuances that you'll need to consider that we'll go over. There are also various definitions of going global, from accepting new currencies to needing to accept non-credit card or local payment methods. Sophia is our expert here, and so she'll be diving into some of the complexities of international growth. And then reducing involuntary churn. So for those of you that are with us that might be new to the subscription space, involuntary churn is when a card fails and you're unable to successfully capture a customer's payment for a subscription. The failure could be tied to an expired card or insufficient funds. And we'll talk about kind of the hard and easy way to manage these common subscription problems. Um, you know, here at Recurly, as we speak to thousands of companies a year, we're actually surprised by the lack of involuntary churn management that some companies have in place and the loss of customers many subscription companies experience from not being able to manage this particular issue. And if there's anything that we all kind of take away from our time together is the overall theme of this webinar is to think about your payment stack and subscription billing technology in a holistic way. The right combination of providers can improve the customer experience as well as yours as you manage a subscription project as part of your everyday job. So why subscription? Sophia, you can start here. Great. Yeah, so there are a lot of benefits of a subscription business model, but I'll, I'll really start um, with some stats. So you're all joining us today, which means you clearly agree that subscriptions are important and frankly pretty complex. Um, but we've seen subscription business models as um, really a, a massive growth opportunity. The trend of offering a subscription has grown over 300% over the last seven years. Um, and a big reason is because they result in customer lifetime value that's six times that of a single purchase model. Um, so, you know, given that it's, you know, as, as Jenna mentioned, we have all different business types from digital streaming to, you know, a bagel of the month club, looking to, um, to offer subscription models to unlock this customer loyalty. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more ab about, uh, you know, how to, how to combat and make sure you have the best solution. Um, but really, you're looking at reducing churn, um, operational efficiency, 
um, and being able to have this consistent dialogue and, and feedback with uh, your provider, but also your customers in a subscription um, ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I think about subscriptions, I often think about the Amazon model, right? Um, this concept of subscribe and save and how much a platform like Amazon actually has on us as consumers, right? They know the type of consumables we use every month. They may need, know your favorite color or what size shoe you wear. So subscription models are super interesting in terms of the amount of data it can provide back to a merchant. Exactly. So recurring payments are pretty unique. Um, I think, you know, they're much different, obviously, in managing a one-time sale, you know, going into a store or even going online to purchase, you know, a t-shirt or pair of jeans, where you may do that once versus buying something on a recurring basis. Often we speak to new subscription merchants that think they can actually launch a, a subscription with an initial set of pricing plans and pretty easily launch that. And they feel pretty well set that those plans will sell successfully just kind of forever, right? But what we've learned over time is that with subscriptions, pricing is a science. So it's rarely the case that someone launches with a particular pricing model or plans and they stick with it. I think landing on a pricing plan that offers the best conversion rate, uh, like I said, is a science. And without a subscription platform, a merchant is unable to gather and review data related to pricing plans and really make you know, intelligent decisions around which ones were the most successful. You know, something to think about that's different than one-time purchases, right, are, is really around the flexibility of, of payments, right? We're often asked the question, you know, can't my payment go gateway just handle subscriptions, right? Doesn't it do that for me? Why do I need recurly? And the quick answer to this is some, not all gateways, offer something called, a, I would call it a payment scheduler that allows you to bill a single plan, maybe repeatedly, maybe on a monthly basis, but they don't, payment gateways really don't offer the robustness of offering multiple plans or the robustness required to launch a true subscription business. When selling a subscription offering, um, you know, flexibility is super important from a customer acquisition perspective. Uh, merchants should be thinking about things, um, you know, to potentially make their subscription box, right, like a box of the month club, maybe more unique. And so an example given here is add-ons. And you may be thinking, like, why would you need an add-on for subscription? Uh, I'm going to use BarkBox, one of our customers, in, as an example of this, where um, they send a box of the month, right, to pet owners every month, whether it's with food or treats. And they decided, hey, you know, we really want to make, um, you know, our box more unique and allow customers to curate their box. So they wanted to allow an add-on of a special treat or a special toy, maybe, for a pet, maybe on the, the month of their birthday, right? So add-ons help to make your product a bit more unique, especially when you're getting something on a recurring basis. Um, also, coupons, you know, can be used to entice loyalty or affiliate marketing or sharing with friends and just the overall flexibility, I think, of supporting how your customers, you know, want to be billed. Something else to think about uh, from a recurring billing perspective is to ensure you're tracking subscri subscription metrics, right? The analytics and reporting a subscription platform offers is especially important as you work towards optimizing your pricing plans, right? That uh, your pricing plans, your offering, and, and even better understanding your monthly recurring revenue. You know, we've seen some companies attempt to build this functionality internally. Uh, I think sometimes, uh, especially those uh, merchants that don't know a ton about subscriptions think, oh, you know, we'll just create some kind of scheduler, scheduler internally. It can't be that hard. But um, obviously we've been building this technology for about a decade, so we know the complexities of it. And, and we usually see merchants kind of go through a learning process of saying, you know, building billing in-house can be really challenging. Not only does it take an entire team typically to build the technology, but also to maintain it over time. Um, and it, it can be hard to do, right? If billing is potentially not your expertise and you're concentrating on building another kind of product. Optimization around successful recurring transactions um, is, is usually like the forefront of our conversations with merchants that are either launching new subscriptions and or even growing their subscription technology. Uh, it, you know, it's not, it's important to not only be prepared to manage the involuntary churn that I mentioned before related to subscription billing, um, when only processing credit cards, right? That involuntary churn kind of comes up when you're, when you're solely a US-based merchant. 
But merchants that are expanding outside of the US often don't realize when you expand your payment method support globally, and this is meaning outside of just the typical you know, US-based credit card brands, there are certain payment methods that are actually better for recurring than others. Um, and Sophia will go into that in a bit. So the most common reason I would say, you know, around optimization, the optimization um, topic, the most common reason merchants reach out to Recurly, even sophisticated enterprise sized merchants, is they need help with managing involuntary churn. The Recurly technology provides a merchant with a three step process to manage this problem. Um, the first step is we embed an account updater product to make sure the card being charged has the most updated information from expiration date to the account info prior to the billing date. The second step is if the card fails, we've built a revenue optimization engine um, that with machine, machine learning will intelligently retry the card based on various data points, um, including from us knowing you know, the best time of day, for example, to retry a card amongst other data points. And then the last kind of third step is automated as well as customized dunning management tools to attempt to gather updated card info to increase the chance of a successful billing cycle. And Sophia, if you want to take the topic of reducing involuntary churn. Yeah, great. Um, so I, I think Jenna touched beautifully on a few of these points. So I'll just go a little deeper. Um, so at a high level, really, the best customer subscription experience is where they enjoy the service seamlessly, uninterrupted. Um, you're never having to ask for their payment details and really then give your customer the option to opt out of your product or service. Um, but declines do happen. Um, it's inevitable things like, as Jenna mentioned, you know, a card expires or insufficient funds. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about tools for both of those. So the first is really, you know, reducing declines due to card changes. Um, so if you're having to reach out to your shopper every time, um, that's, you know, operational burden on your side, friction for the customer. Um, and so looking into lifecycle management tools like account updater or network tokens to make sure your stored cards are up to date um, and preferably getting those updates before you even make a billing run. The, the second point is more along the intelligent retries that she spoke about, which is maximizing the amount that you collect and minimizing the time to collect. So really thinking about this, you know, the amount to collect and the time to collect has two parts. One is your cash flow. So especially if you're um, like a digital good service where you've already provided the service to the shopper and maybe have a, um, a window where you allow their payment to last. There's a cash flow element there. Um, and the second is minimizing the amount of tries because each tried attempt will come with things like processing fees and scheme fees um, and, and any other fees with your other providers along the way, you know, maybe risk fees. Um, and so really looking to take a data informed approach. So um, things like hard versus soft declines, you know, if it's uh, insufficient funds, thinking about, you know, that's a soft decline. So maybe inform your retry logic with local payday. In Europe, they're paid once a month. In the U.S., it's twice a month. Are people paid on the 1st, the 15th, the 25th? So taking all of this into account to make sure that every time you're retrying a card, um, you're maximizing your opportunity to have that result uh, in a successful payment. Another thing that's an, uh, important to think about, I think, if anything, as a merchant, this is probably top of mind for you, right, is, is making sure that your customers have the very best experience. Sophia, did you want to go into this? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm muting and unmuting myself. And it sometimes <laughs> okay. <like me> here. <laughs> um, yeah, so prioritizing your customer's experience. Um, so there's a few parts to this. Um, so once you've driven your customer to the buy button, you want to make sure that you minimize the sign up friction. Um, so this is things like optimizing how your cart looks, your checkout, how the form flows, um, making sure that there are the preferred payment methods, which I'm going to get into a little more, um, but really making sure that if you have a customer that wants to buy, um, they see either the currency that uh, is familiar to them, the payment methods that's familiar to them, um, or even, you know, how you name that payment method on your checkout can, can really be a, a conversion killer. If 
they're used to being seeing it called um, like in the Netherlands ideal and you just call it online banking, you might confuse customers. Um, so things like that to reduce the friction um, and checkout experience. And then the cancellation experience. Um, you know, I think the the crowning jewel of, of cancellation is it's very easy to cancel your Netflix subscription, but almost no one does it. And so really focusing on having a product that is, is so good and so sticky that your shoppers aren't wanting to cancel. But if they do decide to leave you, um, you know, things like making sure you make it an opportunity to communicate with the customer or get feedback with the customer or um, perhaps offer an incentive for them to stay for another month or billing cadence. So everything like that to make sure that anytime your shopper is, is interacting with your website or the billing form, that it's very smooth and easy um, and doesn't cause any extra friction and frustration. That's a great point, Sophia. Something that um, I think about too is especially post COVID, right? When you think about maybe gyms, right? Or even movie theaters that had to shut down locations. A perk of using Recurly is we actually offer a feature called pause, which would allow a user to go into their account and ultimately just pause the billing of their subscription, which um, um, our, many of our kind of nationwide movie theater customers actually use uh, post COVID. And this prevents a lot of things, right? Number one, it prevents you from having to acquire that customer again, right? Also having that customer maybe go in and just fully delete their, their payment data from there. And then when you reopen, now you have to go back and try to try to gain that that customer back. So things like pause even during a cancellation experience can can make a, a world of a difference. Exactly. Um, and then another point that came to mind when you mentioned that was um, if, if you have a very difficult cancellation flow, you run the risk that a shopper gets frustrated and just calls their card and initiates a charge back, which is costly for you. Um, you know, a bad customer experience that means when, you know, either the COVID, post-COVID world comes to be or they decide they want to use their, your service again, they're even less likely to return if they've had um, a frustrating experience like that. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, the next topic we're going to cover is about going global. And so there are lots of logos or, or uh, symbols here on the slide, and I don't want anyone to get too nervous or overwhelmed uh, by it. Um, you may think if you're a U.S. Uh, merchant, for example, like what are all of these different, um, you know, compliance things I have to worry about? I think most merchants know about PCI. Uh, if you're processing credit cards, you have to know about PCI to make sure credit card data is being secured. But there are these other kind of mandates and security things you need to worry about when you start to process outside the U.S. So this could be um, either you're moving to a, a non-US based location or you're opening an office outside the US and or you just start servicing non-US based customers. So things like GDPR and PSD2 are things in Europe, for example, that you need to think about. Going global can be a very overwhelming idea, right? As a merchant, you say, okay, we need to build our base outside the United States, but how do we do that? Um, funny conversations we have sometimes are merchants that are super nervous and say, okay, I have to turn on every country and every payment method in the next 30 days so that I can fully go global. And that's, that's really not the case, right? Um, what we've seen is the most successful approach is to have a staged approach to expansion. So typically a US-based merchant, for example, will launch cross-currency. And what is cross-currency? That's when you're able to present your product in a local currency to your customer outside the US and then maybe just settle that transaction back to the US dollar um, because you're only US based, right? So you may only have a US bank account. And you test that, you know, what currencies, what countries did we actually see adoption before you go kind of into the more sophisticated approach, which is after testing cross-currency, you then can start to contemplate things like local payment methods, right? Which are non-credit card payment methods, or even something called local acquiring, which means that you have a local entity in another country, for example, so that you can get um, basically you know, less expensive rates, depending on how you would like to set up your company. This is definitely Sophia's expertise, so I'm gonna let her go into some of the complexities around uh, local payment experiences. Yeah, so really it's delivering the best local payment experiences. And this slide is uh, probably a bit overwhelming to look at, and in some ways that's the point. Um, different countries have really different norms by who likes to use what form of payment, 
Um, by vertical, it can be different, right? B2B versus uh, direct to consumer can be very different in terms of what payment methods make sense for your shopper. Um, and, and many countries aren't as card centric as say the US. So you may not only be needing to expand into to new countries, but also wrap your head around um, different forms of payment, um, you know, operationally that can mean different things in terms of settlement timelines. Um, but really you wanna make sure to the earlier point that when you've, uh, when you've done all the marketing, when you've done all of the pushes to, to make your product um, attractive to, to shoppers in other countries, that payments isn't a blocker to them enjoying your service. Um, and, so, and another point on that is not every payment method, method is compatible with seamless recurring, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not the best payment method to capture local shoppers. So there can kind of be this, um, this waiting and decision making you have to do as a business on on what are the, the best ones to that work with your business model. Um, so quickly, I'll talk a little bit about the, an example being Ideal in the Netherlands. Um, we're a Dutch company, so I often use Ideal as, as my, uh, my example. Um, but Ideal is the online banking method for the Netherlands. Um, you know, most Dutch people aren't using credit cards regularly. Debit cards are still quite popular. A lot of debit cards don't even work for online. Um, and so Ideal is the predominant way to pay um, in the Netherlands. And Ideal itself doesn't offer a recurring functionality. But however, what we've been able to build is we can do the initial sign up flow through Ideal to get the shoppers uh, payment details or you know banking details, and then run all subsequent billing attempts over SEPA, which is a more pan-European online banking system. Um, and so there are these creative ways that, that the e-commerce ecosystem has come um, to support recurring uh, merchants like this. The great thing too about working with Adyen is they have really great global data around payment method, payment method adoption, right? There are some countries outside of the United States where credit cards actually are just fine from an optimization perspective, right? So, um, you know, being able to engage with Adyen to get more data around certain areas of the world and maybe what payment methods you should be thinking about is definitely something they'd be happy to help with. Exactly, so we take a really consultative approach with our merchants on looking at who is your shopper, um, where are you going, what is your business model, um, and really taking a hands-on approach and working with our merchants um, on, you know, of these three methods in this country, which is the best for you to go with, um, which is the, the least lift for you to go with, um, what are the, as Jenna mentioned earlier, what are any compliance things to be aware of? Because some methods you can do with your US entity, even if it's a local method to a different country, and some require you to have a local presence. Um, and so we really take an approach with when working with merchants of, of finding the best mix of payment methods uh, for you and for, um, for your different nuances like that. So both Sophie and I have talked a little bit about, I think our platform separately a bit, kind of what our expertise is around subscriptions and then also around Adyen's expertise around global payments. And I thought it might make sense to just kind of go through how do we work together from a technical perspective, right? Like how do I get a Recurly and Adyen solution in one? And so ultimately Recurly sits at the gateway level, meaning that we've actually done the integration to Adyen. So if you're thinking of using our joint solution, you would integrate to the Recurly API and then be able to pretty simply, once you have commercials set up with Adyen, plug in something called gateway credentials into the Recurly uh, interface and then get started processing live payments. So you have the merchant website, you kind of have your Recurly implementation and then Adyen is then tied into Recurly. Using Recurly for payments, um, you know, billing, invoicing, reporting, all the things we've kind of talked about, um, it, the, the buck doesn't just stop there in terms of our functionality, right? We also have integrations to lots of other uh, software platforms from a CRM like a Salesforce, ERP or accounting systems uh, like a QuickBooks or a NetSuite. We also power taxes through partners like uh, Avalara and Vertex, for example, and then also have some fraud technology that we implement too if you need um, kind of a more robust type of technology. Where Curly has very much um, a plug and play philosophy to our platform, right? We don't, we're not asking you to rip and replace your entire technical stack or technical infrastructure to add the Curly. Uh, we really just want you to plug in the various elements of the technical stack you have in place.
Great. And and I think similar to Recurly, we also take a very plug and play um, and unified approach. So at Adyen, we've built um, a single global platform for merchants to connect to. And in, in this ecosystem, Recurly has done all the heavy lifting of that integration. Um, but typically, the payments value chain is multiple disparate partners that you have to connect to or one partner operating multiple platforms. You could have, you know, working with one partner, but actually uh, integrating to multiple platforms under the hood with them. And so we've taken the approach to build, you know, the risk tooling, the processing, acquiring capabilities in-house on the one platform. Um, and really, we see this having value in a few ways, which is first allowing more operational scalability for our merchants. So really turnkey integrations of new methods or new countries or new tooling, um, but also by owning so much of the payment life cycle, we have better data and visibility um, into things such as decline reasons or issuer nuances and performance, um, which really allows us to build optimization tools on top of that to further rescue transactions um, and help improve your auth rates and reduce things like involuntary churn. And so really the solution together is pretty powerful um, because you have access to, to the Adyen platform for payments and the Recurly platform for your billing success. Um, and, and together you, you access our single platform, which has over 250 payment methods, 18 plus sediment currencies. I think we're maybe up to like 23 as of today. Um, and because you have this integration through Recurly, many of these payment methods, especially those that support Recurling, are really the flip of the switch for you, which means you have access to turnkey growth. Um, you also have access to thought leadership from, from two great payments companies, um, both that want to help your subscriptions be successful. And so I think really by working with Recurly and Adyen on the, on the back end as your payments provider, you really uh, tap into breadth globally um, and, and success for your subscriptions business. Again, thank you for the time you spent with us today. I uh, wanted to do a quick recap of some of the topics that we chatted about. I think, you know, the first is make sure you're asking the right questions up front, right, as you set up your teams for success at scale. Uh, many uh, US-based merchants will start with a particular gateway and realize as they grow, you know, either pricing is too high or maybe the um, currencies they need or payment methods they need aren't available on that gateway. So to make sure you're asking the right questions as you set up your, your subscription product and to know that maybe you start somewhere and you'll have to graduate right to new solutions over time. And we're happy to help you answer some of those questions as they come up. Also to look at your payment stack and your billing stack as a holistic offering right and or product to know that it's it's pretty important to know who's handling both ends of that equation equation who's processing your payments as well as who's your actual billing vendor leveraging automation is really important i think we're, we're still surprised by some very large merchants that are handling um, kind of retry logic reach um, trying their to rebuild their customers on a manual basis. They have a spreadsheet uh, and these are merchants doing millions of dollars a year. So being able to find a way to leverage automation uh, to recover revenue and obviously improving operational efficiencies through good reporting and good data. And then the last piece is to make sure that whoever you decide to partner with, right, are they also partnered with the right providers to make going global seamless, right? Do they have uh, a good partnership that they've locked arms with either a payment provider to, to know, um, you know, the complexities of international and really how to walk you through step by step, how to go from just being a domestic merchant to also growing, it, growing into um, other parts of the world. So we, we have a minute or two to answer some questions here. Uh, give me a quick second here. So one of the questions that was asked was around complexity of global payments. Is there anything I have to worry about from a tax perspective if I need to expand outside the US? That's kind of a loaded question. Sophia knows this. Um, it depends on where you go, quite <laughs> honestly, right? Um, if you're going into Europe, uh, yes, there are some tax things to worry about. There are uh, implementation to tax partners that can handle some of the heavy lifting for you. Some areas of the exactly. world are, are more difficult than others, right? 
Exactly. I think my answer always to this question, which is a, a common question and a great thing for you to be thinking about, is I am not um, able to give you formal tax advice, um, but there there are a lot of firms that help uh, merchants with these kinds of questions. Um, and really, it is a country by country basis. Um, in Brazil, you have something called the Nota Fiscal, which has to be sent with each payment, which is kind of like a tax slip. Um, and, and so there really is varying uh, regulation depending on the country and depending on if you have a local entity that can change things. So if you're doing cross-border payments, you know, using U.S. acquiring in your U.S. entity, that can be very different than if you have a local presence um, and are doing local acquiring with a partner in that country. Yeah, that's a great point. And both Adyen and Recurly have um, kind of good partners that can help you from um, kind of a consulting perspective to help you figure this out if it's something that's a bit difficult for you to figure out internally. Another question that was asked is, are all gateways alike? Uh, it looks like many gateways process international. So what's the difference between them and Adyen? Um, I'll take the first part of this, Sophia, if you wanna like maybe um, fill in the blanks if, if I don't cover it all is, it's true. There are lots of gateways that claim to do international or that do international. But typically, um, you know, most gateways that you've heard of based in the United States, especially or have launched predominantly in the United States, is they usually only do cross currency, uh, which means that they can process it in the international currency. But usually they're settling that back to the U.S. dollar. It kind of goes back to the slides we had before around like local payments where that can get a bit complex. So, yes. Uh, gateways can claim they're international, but I think the optimization piece, right, um, Sophia, is something they should be thinking about. Exactly. Um, so optimization is one of them, but then I think the other big important thing to think about is operational overhead for you as the merchant. Um, so you may integrate to a gateway, but they could be integrated to, you know, a dozen plus different providers on the back end. And depending on the commercial setup, is your reporting the same? You know, to you, it looks like you're, you have one partner and to do five different payment methods, but it could be five different partners on the back end for that gateway. So is there unified reporting? Um, do you have to have commercial agreements with all of those downstream partners? Depending on your own InfoSec teams, do you have to do assessments of all those downstream partners? So it's really looking at um, if it's a one-stop shop, how, how operationally helpful is that for you? Um, and, and so I think that's one part. And also looking at, you know, how do they choose their partners if they're not the full stack themselves? So we at Adyen always prefer to be full stack, um, you know, for, for the things I mentioned like optimization um, and data flow, but also operationally, um, kind of the more parties you put into it, the, the more complexity it gets um, for, for your team's operationally scaling. And we'll answer one last question here. The question was around, have you seen any trends in recurring in a post-COVID world? <laughs> and so um, I think we were a bit surprised actually by some of the trends that we saw post-COVID. We were a bit nervous um, when quarantine hit that you know maybe, especially with lots of people losing their jobs, that box of the month club adoptions and things like that would decrease. But we saw actually some pretty exciting trends for being a subscription billing uh, platform in that, number one, we saw obviously a huge uptick in digital streaming adoption, right? People were at home. Uh, the only kind of entertainment they had was digital streaming, not only for them, but maybe for their kids uh, to keep them busy during the day. So we have seen a huge uptick in adoption in digital streaming post COVID. But also when it comes to physical goods, we didn't see the drop that we had initially thought we'd see. So something that was interesting from a psych psychology perspective is that without being able to go out and do things post COVID, people actually wanted to keep their subscription box. Uh, I think in a way, right, like getting your FabFitFun box or um, maybe your jewelry box of the month, right, was maybe the only bit of excitement you might get being that you're not able to entertain yourself in other ways. So we've actually seen a greater adoption and an uptick in um, customer, you know, more customers in certain verticals than than we um, originally had suspected we'd see. Yeah, well, thank you. I, it, exactly the same. I don't have anything to add there, um, but I think what we see whenever there's a bit of economic uncertainty is especially the lower ATV, like you know, small joys type things, actually still do fairly well. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, thank you again, everyone, for your time today. If you have any questions that you weren't able to submit to us, feel free to reach out to us via email. You can find me at Jenna at recurly.com and Sophia.goldberg at adyen.com. Have a great day and thanks again. Thank you all. Take care.